Hi, and welcome to the Desert Lady Diaries podcast, a weekly conversation with women who found their home in the Mojave Desert. I'm Dawn Davis, and this is episode number 38. If you're a first-time listener, welcome. And if you're a returning listener, thank you so much for coming back. If you're looking for more information about the podcast, past guests, or want to catch up on previous episodes, or just want to drop me a line, it's all at the website, DesertLadyDiaries.com. We're on Facebook and Instagram at Desert Lady Diaries and on Twitter as Desert Lady Diary. Today, Eva Soltes shares how filming a documentary about a composer led her to a life in the desert. And welcome back to Desert Lady Diaries. My guest today is Eva Soltes, a filmmaker, dancer, photographer, arts producer, who currently lives and works in Joshua Tree, California, where she has founded and is the director of Harrison House Music, Arts, and Ecology. It's a nonprofit artist residency, performance program, and community gathering place based at Harrison House, which is a landmark straw bale studio built by the late composer Lou Harrison. Also housed at this location is Soltis's extensive media about 20th century American composers and other notable artists. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad you're here. I usually start with the question, what was your first encounter with the desert? I came here with Lou Harrison, who was building the Straw Bale House, and I was making a documentary about him, so I decided... I may as well include the building of the Straw Bale House in the documentary because I was waiting on his opera to get produced. So I came here with Lou. We, I, you know, drove. I was living in the Bay Area. We had an overnight. I think it was in Gorman and continued on in the morning. And when I got here, I recognize your description of what happened to you because the same mm. thing happened to me. Yeah. I looked around the moment I came and it just felt familiar. And I thought, why have I never been here before? Mm-hmm. How, how come I've never been here? I was raised in L.A., although I was living in the Bay Area by then for many, many years, and I just fell in love with it. I right away started looking at real estate books, little magazines, but I was living in San Francisco, and I thought, well, that's an awful long way away to have a second home here, and I'm asking people I knew, anybody want to go in on a house in Joshua Tree? <laughs> She's for 50 grand. You can get two and a half acres and a house, and... You know, I couldn't find anybody that was interested, but my heart sort of stayed here, you know, from that very first trip. So each time Lou came down here in the process of building the house, because it went on for another at least year and a half Mm. after that first trip that I, I took with him, I would come with him. So I ended up making the film about the building of the Straw Bale House. And I always say it's a trick ending to the film because the filmmaker ended up with the house. <laughs> That's amazing. And it's a beautiful place. I've gone to several events there and it's really beautiful. And I think it's really transformed, obviously, from when it was first built. And now there's art all around it and it's mm-hmm. just a really, really beautiful space. Yeah, thank you. So how did the process of moving here permanently happen. Yeah, how did that happen? Well, I tell you, I say that I dipped my toe in a stream and got carried away by the current. (laughs) That's that's what I say. Because every time I came, I was so happy to get here, and I never wanted to leave. That was me on weekends. That one month I paid extra rent in L.A. I paid a month there in the first month here, and I would come on the weekends, and Sunday evening would roll around, and I was like, man, I really don't want to go back. Right, and that is what happened to me. And so when I was making the film about the house, this one weekend, I came down three times to shoot the finish of the building, and it was never finished because it was a bunch of rock climbers building it. <laughs> be, oh, great, I'd be taken off. It's a nice day. So it was really taking a long time to finish, which was difficult for Lou because he was elderly. He was in his 80s by mm-hmm. then. But anyway, the last time I came down, one of the people that worked for Lou said, please, please, please help us finish one room so we can move this furniture. And they brought furniture down, and it was still not finished. And I had just finished like a, a remodel on a studio of mine in the Bay Area. So I said, well... That's the hardest thing to do is to take back the house from the workers. But if you want me to stay and help you, then we're going to finish the whole house and you can't back down. He was like, okay. And there was a point at which he was trying to back down. I was like, no, you mm-hmm. can't. Go get more of whatever it was we need. Anyway, so I did manage to kind of help get the house finished that weekend. Lou wasn't around. Lou was at a conference. And somebody needed to remain there 
to give him the key. So all of this had gone on on the weekend without mm. Lou being there. And so I said, I will, you know, then I'll get the shot of him walking in and seeing it. <laughs> nice. You know? So it happened that it was about four hours of the most beautiful weather. And there was a really comfy bed that had been brought into the great room because we did manage to bring furniture in. I flung the doors open, this beautiful breeze came through, and I do Indian classical dance. Mm. The concrete floor there was perfect for my dance tradition. Normally you wouldn't think that, but it is. (laughs) So I danced, and I just fell in love with the place. I was like, oh my God, what a... What a miracle, what a beautiful mm. place this is, and you know, and the whole thing. And so when Lou came after I got my shot and he went and walked around and all that, I said, Lou, it's a perfect dance floor for me. And he said, Dear, this place is for you too. And mm. he really made it to share with his friends. Mm. We had a very long, we had a 30 year relationship by then, you mm-hmm. know, of professional and friendship yeah. and so forth. So I knew him very, very well, and I knew that it was going to be constant inflow of art and artists and musicians of all kinds, because that's what Lou gathered around him, and he was one of the most generous people artistically, so it was pretty natural, given my career has been in the arts always. I'm 100% in the arts, Mm and 100% producing music, producing, I've done all the jobs, honestly, you know, I have agented people when I, it's something that I feel strongly about that I want to do, I will do it. Mm -hmm. I feel 100% blessed in what I've managed to get done, right? (laughs) The experiences I've had, you know, career wise and, and personally, but so it was very clear that that was the fate of the house. And given my lifetime of work and working with Lou and working with other great composers and other great artists and so forth, that it became a natural for me. I knew that eventually I wanted to do music programs and everything there. It didn't happen right away because, Mm. A, I wasn't living here. I was living up in the Bay Area in San Francisco. And B, I was in what I call the elder part of my life, which was taking care of my mother. Right. So when your parents need you and I would do it again you know I mean I was there for my mother so she was in LA I said okay I would I was going to LA very frequently from the Bay Area so my rule for myself was if I go to LA I come to Joshua Tree even if it's for a day and I always felt the benefits of it though I didn't know anybody here Mm -hmm. I would bring my camera and just do things on my own and so I don't know. Did I answer your question? I don't know. What We're it was. getting there because you said you didn't know anybody. So I was what I was working towards. Oh, how is did I move? How here? did the permanent move right. happen? Let's start there. Oh yeah. yeah. So, as I said, I wanted to do concerts here. I was very frustrated trying to get anything done here without living here. I was trying like crazy to get some trees planted, to get some things done to the house. I had. A female architect friend designed a little addition for me. I couldn't find anybody to build it. It was very, very frustrating. So some part of me realized that if I wanted to actually do something, if I wanted to see if the, the house is going to have a life, I needed to be here. So that's one little realization mm. I had. But number two, it was a difficult thing. Eventually, I met one neighbor and... That neighbor was like going, oh, yes, move here, move here, move here. And like, really? <laughs> and, and so what happened simultaneously was Terry Riley, an American composer, who was a friend of Lou's, was doing a 10th anniversary concert of the death of his Indian music teacher. Mm. And I went to that. And Terry said, oh, let's do a tribute like this for Lou down at the house. He said, Lou had invited me. I could never get there while he was alive because he Lou lived one year exactly after the house was oh done oh my gosh yeah and to the day honestly wow when I was there and so I said oh yes 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 let's absolutely do it so I'm like wow Terry wants to come and do something here so I said to that one neighbor I said is there an audience here right right <laughs> and she said I can get a hundred people I'm like you can get a hundred. Where, where would are you they? Get a hundred people around here. Like really, where? And she said, "But I can't." I said, "Well, bring thirty-five people, and I know five people who will drive in from L.A." Mm. And so there, that was that. Now, it happened to coincide with the fact that 
this adorable little cottage across the street from the Harrison house was being offered to me off market. It was a, such a cute house. I had missed it a couple of years earlier when it was on the market, but I'm like, you can't own two houses here and not live here. I'm like, what are you thinking, you know? <laughs> well, within a year or something, the price was doubling, and they had painted it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyway, so it was being offered to me off market. So for about a month or two before this concert, I was really putting them off going, well, have you checked the roof? Have you checked this? Have you checked that? And they mm-hmm. lived in L.A., and I was like, oh, my God, if I buy a second house, I'm, I have to live here. So I just kept looking for signs. Mm. Like, I'm going to go back and I'll look for a sign. Am I supposed to move? And the signs were always there. They were just always there. And the right. final one was so vivid. So that weekend, the concert happened, and there were the house was filled with these wonderful, wonderful people. I could feel that. I could tell. And I mm. went wow, there is a community here that I feel like I could be part of. I don't know who these people are. Listen, a third of them had been in India. Nobody left, which surprised me. I went, wow, people really listen here. People were so happy to be invited into the Harrison house. And I'll never forget we made a little stage out of straw bales and put a carpet on it, you know, for Terry. (laughs) That weekend, the people that owned the house said to me, listen, you have to let us know or we're putting it on the market. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay. And I went home and I looked for one more sign and it was loud and clear. And I'm like, okay, I'm just moving. And don't look back. It is, Mm -hmm. it has been nearly 11 years. Oh my goodness. And I I was going to ask how long ago that was. Okay. Yeah. I thought I would give it two years. I thought in two years, I can tell if this wants to be something, you know, and I thought about having a pied de terre in LA, maybe in Pasadena or something like mm. that, which then I never did. And I never did. And I don't miss it. And right. I, you know, I travel, I, you know, I've been so fortunate to have been absolutely welcomed into the music scene in LA. So I had a, a very dear friend that was a music critic, there is still a music critic there that immediately started introducing me to people and just brought me in. So professionally it's actually been a great thing too yeah there's some great really great culture there, here yes there really really is yes and it's community yeah absolutely and everybody participates I, I say sometimes to people like I don't know what to do sometimes on any given night and it's not because there's a lack of things to do mm-hmm. it's that there's so many things to do and nine times out of ten you know each of the people that are doing them and you have to kind of decide like okay who gets who do I get to see tonight (laughs) yeah who gets my attention (laughs) right exactly because there's so many things going on well when I started it wasn't the case so when I started the music program about 10 years ago there was not that much going on actually Mm -hmm. you know Teddy Quinn was doing his open mics at Pappy and Harriet's and it and I don't even think he'd started the saloon the beatnik didn't exist Mm -hmm. Um, it was an art gallery right was it at that time when you came? Um, no, when I came, it was actually called the Beatnik. Okay, so <laughs> it, was it was like coffee the coffee house. house. Okay, it was the coffee okay. house. Because I understand before that it was the Red Arrow. The Red Arrow, yeah. but the Red Arrow was down the street on the other side of the highway. Oh, okay. And so it it existed, but then when the Beatnik closed, the Red Arrow moved across the street. I see. And that's when that Red Arrow went up in the parking lot. Gotcha. Okay. And then it became partly it was Barnett. English mm. took over half of it and he was doing transmission so he was doing classes out of there wonderful things and storytelling and all sorts of cultural programs which before I think he had a permanent place at the campground for the yeah. music festival yeah. yeah yeah so there was really almost nothing going on and I used to worry about not being able to fit people in because we have a maximum of 50 people mm. but I always said well whoever's supposed to be here will be here and it'll work out and you know and it has yeah for sure so you knew your neighbor right and then you met people when they came to see Terry Riley uh, yeah but I didn't really meet people it was it was well, I you're running a saw thing. them right yeah I didn't know who they were so once you got here and kind of got settled into your situation how did your friendships and how did you start getting to know people? My wonderful neighbor, Luana, and we call each other best neighbors. She's oh, my best neighbor. I didn't know she was your neighbor. She's been referred to me for the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Luana, she's such an amazing person. So 
she was having me over for dinner like three or four times a week mm. and inviting people over and introducing oh, me. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah. So she was really handpicking people for me to meet. And I remember how momentous it was when I actually went somewhere without her. <laughs> <laughs> It was months. Right. You know? Yeah. It was months. I, I really, you know, she right. was the one that was telling me, you know, what was going on, what was happening. And, mm-hmm. and you know, and I was quite tied up with trying to do the improvements that I'd wanted to do. Because you're right. It was pretty much just bare bones. It had only been finished for a year. Lou never lived here. He was only visiting. Mm-hmm. And it was just sort of a house plunked down in raw desert, period. So I then went about trying to get all this work done so I was really very busy with that and then plus I had this shadow over my head for Mm. a number of years which was I needed to finish my film on Lou it wasn't done so it was this big shadow over my head you know where I couldn't completely look up into the beautiful sky and look around me I I had this burden Mm. you know on me And, and in the end you know, Robbie Rob mm-hmm. and I kind of moved in and he edited with me and he was fantastic. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. He no, he's good. Mm-hmm. You're here. You're working on this film. You're meeting people. Were there ever times when you felt, oh, what have I done? Never. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that. Yeah. Never have I felt that way. Yeah. I have only gotten more and more appreciative and, mm-hmm. and you know, I, I got way more involved in the community than I ever dreamed that I was going to because mm-hmm. it was not too long after I was here that I met Vera Topinka. Vera is, a, oh, you all see some other ones you okay. need to talk to about <laughs> your, with your podcast. But she's not on Facebook, so she doesn't, she misses some of this stuff. Right. But Vera had been a photographer. She still does somewhat, but less and less. Um, moved here, didn't know anybody, moved here from Marin. Same thing, fell in love with it. Single woman. I think of this generally as a matrilineal culture Mm -hmm. really if you look at all the businesses in town you know majority of them are owned by women but anyway that's another thing and in my neighborhood in particular there's a lot of women that live on their own but that's a whole nother story you know (laughs) well we might Um, get around to it yeah so I met Vera and she was on the chamber of commerce board which didn't interest me really she's going no please 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 we're recruiting new board members and we really want you and I'm like Listen, I'm in nonprofit, and I've been in nonprofit in the arts my entire mm-hmm. career. Yeah. No, well, no, no, no. We're trying to brand this as an arts town. We we really want people involved in the arts. I'm like, okay, I will come to meetings. I will give advice, but I I can't. I'm just I can't commit. I can't. <laughs> <that. laughs> yeah, right. So uh, by and by, I became the president. <laughs> Right. And it was a humongous amount. I mean, it was really yeah. intense work. And as the president of the Chamber of Commerce, I helped raise the money to sue the county to keep Dollar General out. Well, thank you very much for doing that. You're welcome. <laughs> so I've been a pretty vocal person. Mm-hmm. It turns out in the community I'm pretty opinionated. Mm-hmm. And I do notice that when you first get somewhere you just want to roll up your sleeves and be part of the community and everything and I I would see the people had been here a while just going oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah so it kind of cycles around Mm -hmm. I did my five years on the chamber of commerce board and then I joined the the council for a transition and Mm -hmm. so I I get into different Mm -hmm. things and then I go into phases where I go well I need to rejuvenate Mm -hmm. and kind of step back a little bit yeah but I did a lot it was, and it's been wonderful with the conservation community. Mm. So I got to be a spokesperson for the monuments when that happened, mm-hmm. and I got to go lobby with them, and which I'm so happy to do because one of the things that happened for me being here is the Harrison House transition from being Harrison House Music and Arts to being Harrison House Music, Arts, and Ecology. Because living in the desert, we have the privilege of being part of nature. Absolutely. And really deepening the understanding about how important and beautiful and wonderful that is Mm -hmm. and how important it is to protect it. In that, are there some programs that are happening even right now at Harrison House with the ecology part Mm -hmm. in mind? And what are those and what are they what are they doing? Well, we started So it's now, I guess, two years ago, it was an idea, a whole art and ecology site across Mm -hmm. the street. And so 
when you get an idea, you realize it's a good idea when it takes off on you, right? Mm-hmm. You know, when you're yep. going, wait a minute, wait a minute, let me try to keep these eggs in the basket. It's going right. so fast. So it was like that with mm-hmm. the ecology site. And I did a permaculture design certificate with Warren Brush, who has a, a farm in Carpinteria, but he travels all over the world. He's mm-hmm. in Africa a lot and in Europe a lot, teaching permaculture. Very amazing man. Mm-hmm. I spent a month at his farm. So I managed to ask to get him to agree to come and do an introduction to permaculture mm-hmm. here. So in preparation for that, which would have been, it'll be two years ago, April, I said, oh my goodness, one thing I've learned about the permaculture is that it's a community. And you need to be able to house people. You need, you know, even if it's camping, you need a place for volunteers. You cannot do it all yourself. It's a community interaction. Group effort. Yeah. yeah, it's a group effort. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, well, then he's coming in April. So in February, I said, it's time. We need to make a place for people to camp. So I have friends that are builders and so forth. So we made a composting toilet. We got offered through the land trust AmeriCorps volunteers for a weekend. They needed to do some community service. Went, That's oh, yeah, great. Over yeah. Here. So we managed to get a lot done. We I brought in Nicholas Holmes, who taught them how to do a gray water system. So we plumbed an outdoor shower, got the water going to it. I had a horse corral. We got that oiled, and I had a huge bottle collection. We got that organized. So, mm-hmm. but it was still the boneyard. It was a junkyard, basically, mm-hmm. that I was doing this in. Well. Very soon after, I got hooked up with an amazing artist, Dominique Moody, who had her tiny house. Mm, Yes. Right. I actually came out and I missed the tiny house. I saw the, um, I don't remember what it's called, in the ground. The pad? No. No. It's the... um, Oh, the Kiva. Oh, yeah. We're calling it a Kiva now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. So Dominique was there for 16 months. Now, it was the most wonderful coming together of people collaboration between Dominique and I just Mm. fantastic because I had this whole boneyard full of junk I didn't understand when I met her that she was an assemblage artist and more than that she had just finished years and years and years of realizing her dream of building a tiny house that itself was a piece of public art because it's Mm. it's so beautifully done inside and out. Her idea was she gave up her studio in L.A., being a studio artist, and said, the world will be my studio, and I will travel from place to place and make art. Wow. And do it, you know, with this whole community, Mm. you know, in mind. Now, she had been recommended to me by somebody in L.A., a mutual friend. When I found out that, A she wanted like at least a three month residency and B, she was legally blind. I was like, I am not sure what I'll do with her. This was before I started the art and ecology side. We're going, oh, we need a campground. But eventually she found a place in Joshua Tree. Somebody's referred her to somebody. So she was having six months up here. And finally, after four months, I got to go and meet her, which was crazy. That's how busy it is around here. I could not drive across town to meet somebody for four months. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so when I did, I looked at what she was doing and I met her and I went, you have to come. I don't know what it is you'll do. I didn't fully understand that she had been an assemblage artist. And I said, you know, I have a boneyard. She's going... A boneyard? And I went, well, there's three different locations, my house, the Harrison house and that. So you come and look and tell me where you think you should go. Now, what I know now about her backstory is that some people ridiculed her and said, you can't be an assemblage artist and not have your stuff. You know, this is never going to work, your idea. Well, unbeknownst to me I was like you know don't throw me into the briar patch right right I'm like and and then I said and I have this huge bottle collection to bottles because her work was all about bottles a lot Mm. of it you know the bottles people were represented as bottles in her work in her sculpture and she made bottle bells and all she's going boneyard bottles (laughs) bottles <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> yes so she came and spent 16 months which was started as three months and wow. it was an, an absolute pleasure every single day every single day mm-hmm. you know what we would I'd start the day by meeting with Dominique mm-hmm. and what are her ideas what are my ideas 
And she went about kind of taking the whole site on, which I'd never expected. Wow. I, I actually realized I was going to commission her to do... I had always wanted to do some bottle art around the corral, and mm-hmm. I had always wanted to build down in that kiva. So mm-hmm. I took the opportunity of her being there to do that building down. But anyway, so she's going, oh, can I do something with bottles in the corral? I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> and then <laughs> Whatever I, you want. <laughs> yeah, no, and it was like that because <sighs> so... It's been now two years since it was an idea, and now it's a functioning place. She has gone on. She's gone to New Orleans. I think she'll be back in March, you know. So I said to her, make this a home to come back to whenever you need it. Wonderful. You know, and do not leave. And one of the reasons she was there so long is she would get these opportunities, but they wouldn't be quite the right thing. I said, don't leave just to leave. Right. Right have a good place to go right and then you can go something that's really drawing you pulling you you yeah that that is worthy and is safe and is you know all sorts of things it was being a single black woman in Mm -hmm. this culture in driving around in a tiny and a gorgeous tiny house where there's people who would stop you want to take it away from you Mm. and in a lot of places legally they can i mean it's a scary thing so um anyway so What's going on now, I do have somebody there caretaking it and watering everything and sort of taking care of it, but I'm about to kind of roll up my sleeves and start the next project. We got so much done in those first 18 months and everything, and so it's now kind of time. I do have another introduction to permaculture course coming in the fall, and then followed by a year from April, I'll have a full-blown two-week um, certificate course with Warren oh, wow. Brush, which is a big deal. That is, And yeah. I'll be involving, you know, some of the local people that are doing permaculture mm-hmm. things here, too. So we're kind of getting geared up again, and, and, you know, we've been doing a lot of internal organizing and stuff. I mean, it's mm-hmm. a pretty small operation I run in the sense of we don't have a lot of staff and all right. that, but just really trying hard to keep it going. Yeah. So you and I talked briefly a couple of months ago. We were at an event at the Copper Mountain College for Arts Connection. And there were consultants Mm -hmm. that were brought in essentially to, you said it earlier, somebody said something about, we want to make this an arts destination. So that was then, this is now. Can you bring me up to speed on what's happening with that plan? Plan. Yeah, I've been involved in it. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's, it's so funny. Uh, it's it's good and it's also frustrating. It's very frustrating because we have so much talent in this area and consistently the county doesn't quite get it. So they'll, they have, I'm not saying they've done it this time, but mm. I've often taken our TOT tax money that people pay when they do vacation rentals right. here and hire consultants outside of the area who aren't as good as the people that are here and I have gotten blue in the face sometimes but I think part of the allocation for doing this I do believe came from those earlier years of Mm -hmm. finally pounding into the county it is an arts community and taking them off the highway they would come for meetings they say well we'll meet at the county building and went no let's go up to Sacred Sands. Let's go up to Bobby first. Let's go. And so I took them off the highway one at a time. I took the planning people. I took the economic development people, you know, just down the line, Mm -hmm. all the supervisors, and we really worked it. And and so I think maybe this last allocation partially was them paying attention, going, okay, we need to do a plan. However, part of that is also wrapped into the fact that the county has to do community plans. So I think part of this allocation I found since then is their idea of creating a community plan for this area, and then it becomes a cultural plan that's Mm -hmm. part of it. And I think that's fine. So what has happened with it is that I gave the consultants a really hard time at the first meeting. (laughs) Well, I have to say, and I think I expressed it to you that day, I felt like I was brought there under false pretenses because I didn't know anything in the background. I was just like, oh, this is great. All these art people are getting together. And then all of a sudden they're talking about transportation and moving around and, you know, all this planning. And I'm, you know, and I was sitting with someone who said, I just came from a place where the artists come in, make it cool, and then it's over. 
It jumps the shark. That happens all the time. Right. That is the MO <laughs> of like, you know, economic development. Right. Give it to the artists yeah. and then they'll make something cool. So I was happy it. to hear you were giving them a bit of a hard time. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> and, I, and I did. And I, and, I, and I just said, you know, I'll be watching you. You better do something good with our money. Yeah. You know, and you better produce. And I don't know that we need this plan. Right. However, now having said that, I have met personally some really good people that are in the community that I might not have met otherwise. Mm. So I'm like, okay, if, you know, if in fact we can use what they're doing as a tool to connect people in this community. So I've been advocating for that. Mm-hmm. You know, I had also said to the, 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 the county came to me first and asked me to help them organize this whole thing. Ah. I said, no. I said, do you want me to do it for free again? No, because you don't listen. Yeah. And you don't just, I was like, I was so like <laughs> mad at them, right? Yeah. And then I said, okay, well, I will not be one of the leaders of one of the groups, but I will give my input. And this time mm-hmm. I stuck to that, Good. you know, and I did that. I mean, I think because I have had a life in the arts, 100% with independent artists. Mm. So that is my thing. My thing is not get a university job and teach art. My thing is who are the people, the rugged people out there that don't have a choice because they are artists and this is what they have to do. So my career has been spent with those people and myself included. So And they're the ones that usually have the least resources. Totally. Yeah. Underappreciated, mm-hmm. no resources, no right. appreciation, no I mean just a struggle. So that's part of what the Harrison House is about. It hand picks mm. really gifted people who in general have a career but it's not easy. No, and that, that gives them and affords them an opportunity to really do something special. Yeah. When and, they're you yeah. know, housed and fed, yeah. and then those things are not a worry. That's and right. I think that too leads me to that, I think, is another reason many artists are attracted to come here. Right. The time, the space. Yeah. It just is very conducive to it, creating. It's a very deep breath of fresh air mm-hmm. very deep breath so yeah. so then back to the plan i don't yet know what kind of a plan is going to come of this honestly mm-hmm. there's lots of ideas and here's where i put the screws on them help us get the county to fund it because all of these examples that you've had us read of cultural plans for different townships and cities and all that stuff mm-hmm. Every single one of them is initiated by some government agency that's going to follow it up. Now you're saying, here, take all this time to do a plan, and then you're on your own. We're hoping you'll do it. I was like, no. So I'm trying to hold their feet to the fire. Well, it's exactly, and I don't think it's any different, too, than the, the you know larger community plan. And I read through some of those proposals And I was a project manager. So when I read a proposal that has no time frames, no budget, and no leadership, just like these blank titles that no person is having accountability or ownership for, I'm like, this isn't going to work. No, exactly. (laughs) So I have brought that up to them. Uh So they are good fundraisers. You know, the funny thing is, the one guy, I end up really liking the guy that is in charge of the consulting firm, the lead partner. So that's good. I do end up liking him. I do. But I really have tried to hold their feet to the fire because what I said to them When they call me from the county, blah, 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 cultural plan, I said, I'll give you a cultural plan. Hire some artists to go in the schools. End of the plan. You just wasted all our money. $100,000. Put money in the pocket of artists if you want this to be a cultural plan. So I joined the committee that was about arts education. And as a result... I have had a really good dialogue with the woman that hires artists for all the public schools here. And I will probably, I mean, when this whole thing with Trump came down, or and actually all over the world, it's mm. not just him, it's yeah. just a really a move towards conservatism. I said to myself, two things. It's time to be more vocal about what your work is and what your life is about. Mm -hmm. I had my, you know, if you want to know about what I do, ask to be on the mailing list. I've had a very private thing. I didn't have a website for 10 years. 
And I went, okay, it's time to have a louder voice. It's time to spread what you believe in. It's mm-hmm. time. It's the moment to help the pendulum swing. That's one thing. And the second thing that I realized was that we need to get to the kids. And I started fantasizing about bringing belly dance troupe, Arabic dancing, down to San Bernardino. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, right. take it out of our area. It get all the multi- multicultural artists. Artists are the best ambassadors. Exactly. And I have a huge, I have a huge amount of contact. And this woman from the school system was going, I couldn't find any artists. I've had such a hard time. Wow. So I think because there's so much more going on here for people, I'm feeling like, okay, I stay lean and mean, and I really try to evolve what I'm doing to make a difference, to be Mm -hmm. something that's worthwhile in the community, worthwhile for myself, worthwhile for people. So I want to be working more with younger people, with Mm -hmm. kids. So I think that's a good thing for me, you know, that has come out of it. I've gotten like a little association with Copper Mountain College, which is right across the road. I mean, I should be working with them, you know, all this time. Yeah. It hasn't happened, but I've gotten to know some of the people through this. So I think maybe one of the benefits really is going to be people meeting one another that didn't work together before Mm -hmm. in the community because you start hurting artists and making plans and everything. It's counterproductive. You know, it Mm -hmm. was like when I lived in the Bay Area and people used to put up sculptures in the mud flats that would be like right near the entrance to the Bay Bridge. And eventually, foundations started donating art supplies. I went, well, this is the end of it. Because it had a spontaneity. It had Mm a a renegade quality. You sneak in in the middle of the night and do it. Mm -hmm. You know, now it's like, here's all your supplies, boys and girls. Mm -hmm. Go make something. Well, you're inviting people that aren't as good as the people that came before them. But anyway, so that's another thing. So, you know, is this going to be worthwhile? We'll see. Mm -hmm. The jury is still out. But if a program in the schools can come of it, and these consultants are out there advocating for us with the county. And so that's a good thing since the county doesn't listen to us all the time. So that's what I've observed. And and so I've been trying to be helpful, and they, they wanted people to fill out a little questionnaire or something, you know, so I eventually put it out there going, you know, fill it out, maybe Mm -hmm. we'll get something, I don't know. But my thing was, when there's not a lot of resources and you're trying to create a cultural plan, pay the artists. Yeah. Otherwise, they have to leave. Yeah, I mean, downtown L.A., they were doing a a program of painting the um, utility boxes. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to remember the full scenario, but the bottom line was there was some artist in... This because I went to city council for numerous things, and there was a guy being honored that day who was an artist, and he was having a similar conversation. It was like, well, yeah, thanks for having me here, but let's give more opportunities for artists. And then one of our councilmen stands up and says, oh, we are. We have this program where they're painting the utility boxes. Well, they weren't paying them to paint the utility boxes. It was like... We are going to give you the privilege of being allowed to paint the utility box. Yeah, it's like, you know? screw you. <laughs> Here's an opportunity. Opportunity doesn't pay my rent. No. Do you know? No. So, I mean, I, no, right. I know it. I mean, <laughs> and so I've tried to hammer home, you know, like, pay the artists, pay the artists, pay the artists. Right. You know? Yeah. And you, and you people don't waste our money. If this $100,000 could have gone a long way mm-hmm. Paying artists exactly. to go teach kids. Right. Yeah. So and then those artists spend their money in the community. I mean it's absolutely. all it's all it, tied together. It is, and, and we know that it when you spend it in the community, it turns over like four times more. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here today. It's my pleasure. Talking about Harrison House. Where can people go to learn more about your two week program? Your permaculture? Oh, the, yeah. I don't yet have that on the website, but okay. I should soon. But it's the LouHarrisonHouse.org. Okay, Not great. the, it's LouHarrisonHouse.org. Gotcha. So just keep checking back to the website. There's a contact little place on the website if you want to receive our e-blasts. Mm-hmm. You can sign up. And Lots of good stuff goes on there. Thank you. Really, yeah, really happy to know you. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. Oh, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to the Desert Lady Diaries podcast. I want you to know how much I appreciate you taking the time to tune in. If you heard something that inspired or enlightened you, I'd love to hear about it. Send an email to desertladydiaries at gmail.com or start a discussion with other listeners at the Desert Lady Diaries Facebook page. 
Next week, cosmetologist and herbalist Christina Sanchez joins us and shares her experience of coming to the desert, her perspective on dating here, and her herbal product business, Every Leaf Speaks. If you like this podcast, I would really appreciate it if you would take a moment and write a review on iTunes, Spotify, or whatever platform you're listening from. It helps others find the podcast and extends its reach. Thanks so much for listening.